Hi, everyone. Welcome to our darn first generation college student panel. We are going to let everyone enter into the room and then we'll get started here in about a minute or two. Hi everyone, I see you guys are entering the room. You are here for the darn first generation college student panel. Welcome. Great to see everyone entering our Zoom room. Well, I'll go ahead and kick us off. I will be on our moderator tonight. My name is Mackenzie Rash and I work with Oklahoma State University. We have three awesome panelists that we're gonna to get to hear from. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, starting with Ricky. We'll go Ricky. Brenda, then Zaina, um, but you guys can go ahead and introduce yourselves and then we will kick off with our questions that you guys have submitted beforehand. If you guys have any other questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. We will try to get to those um, uh, depending on how many questions we have, but also if you have any questions for a particular university, um, we will also be putting the darn booklet in the chat for you guys to reach out to those universities specifically. So great to see you all as you all are entering the room. Um, like I said, uh, my name is McKinsey. You're here for the darn um, first generation college student panel. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. But Ricky, go ahead and kick us off. Yes, hello, good evening. My name is Ricky Alarcon with Loyola University in New Orleans. I am a regional representative living in Dallas, Texas. Um, I cover the whole state of Texas and actually everything Western United States, but I call Texas home and thank you for having me. Hi everyone, my name is Verinda Chavez and I work for DePaul University. I am also the regional representative and live here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, and I have a whole state of Texas, but also am a very proud alumni of DePaul. Happy to be here tonight. Hi everyone, my name is Zaina Pasco. I am with the University of Alabama at Birmingham, also known as UAB. Um, like everyone else, I am also based here in Dallas, Texas, and I also recruit the entire state of Texas, um, as well as Louisiana and a lot of other states. And I am very happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. We have about 30 minutes, so not a ton of time together. We're going to go over some of the questions that you guys submitted beforehand. And then if you guys have any questions during this time, go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll try to get to those towards the end of our time. Um, but we will have every panelist answer our uh, questions. And then obviously panelists, if it's repetitive or you agree with the other panelists, you can go ahead and say that too. But we will kick it off with our first question. I'm the first student in my family going to college. Where do I even start or what should I know? Ricky, we'll go ahead and start with you. What would you tell um, the student? Yeah, so, the, you know, when I was going back in, when I was in high school, you know, years ago, you know, there's a, there's definitely a lot more resources. I am a first generation college student, uh, started out as, as a, a transfer student. So I started out at a community college. And so definitely your counselors are probably your number one resource to help you out as far as finding out what kind of resources are there. Um, my counselor helped me out. I, I knew I wanted to go to a four year school, but I kind of wasn't ready yet. So, uh, but I started out at a local community college uh, was my route. And so, so what I did was a two plus two program. And so my counselor kind of let me know that there's where you could take college credits at a local school. And then once you get ready to transfer to a larger school, you can. Um, so definitely your, your high school counselors, number one, uh, but also recruiters just like us. I know, you know, back then they was, there wasn't many recruiters when they when shows you how old I am. Uh, but again, now there's regional reps, there's reps for, you know, that can help you out. And so they can let you know how to get the application process started. Um, I might have, I've, I only had a, like maybe a few schools in mind, but if, if the resources that they have now with reps and all these college fairs and all these things at the events they have, I probably would have gotten more involved. But again, it's just asking those questions, especially when you're on your own figuring things out. You just need to talk to someone and 
luckily my counsel was able to help me out to ask the right questions to the recruiters. Oh, thank you, Ricky. I feel like Ricky also brought up a great point that made me think about it, especially when you're a student, whether you're first generation or not, you're not just one thing, right? You have several different identities and which is what we call intersectionalism. So, you know, you may not just be first generation, but you may be coming from underrepresented backgrounds, whether it is being female, whether it is your, you know, ethnic background, your religion. So really taking some time to think about what do I feel like I need the support in the most, or do I need support in all of the areas and start looking for resource centers at the university um, and just start asking around, even if it's asking, like where you said, one person, your college, you know, rep, um, whether it is going to the Office of Student Involvement and just saying, hey, I'm looking for a resource in this and then start branching out and getting support. And it's okay to get support in every area you need, depending on your background and your identity, because um, it, it can be a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're first generation. Um, I think my route was a little different. I'm originally from this really small town in Mississippi, and I did not have a lot of support from my counselor. So when it was time for me to go to school or try to figure out exactly what I wanted to do, um, I was always told my whole life, oh, you're really good at math and science. So um, I actually Googled like majors for math and science and I looked at a biomedical engineer and I saw how much money they made. And I said, mom, I'm gonna be a biomedical engineer. And she was like, uh, I don't know if that's the one for you. Like I really see you working with people. And I was like, no, I'm gonna be rich. And I remember looking into schools and I literally Googled schools that had biomedical engineering. And I put that was not in the state of Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, anywhere that was near me because I wanted to just go. I just wanted to spread my wings. No one in my family had ever left the state of Mississippi. And I'll never forget like my mom telling me, if this is something that you wanna do, you need to know everything you can about this particular program. So one thing I did do, I shadowed a actually uh, a black female. She was a biomedical engineer at this company called Medtronics in the Memphis area. And I thought it was super duper interesting. And so that was like my first step. So that's what I always tell students. If there's something that you want to do, it can be very hard for first generation because you probably don't know anyone that might have majored in that field that you're wanting to go into. So it's best to find someone, like use your resources, ask around. Or if like my sister wants to be a veterinarian, she just called veterinarian offices and said, hey, can I shadow or can I just ask you questions? Um, and right now with Zoom being very popular is kind of nice because they can set up like these Zoom meetings where you can just ask any questions that you have. And that way it'll help you start your search when it comes to looking for colleges that actually have your field. Um, I think a lot of first generation students mess up because they wanna go to a school and the school doesn't have the major that they're interested in that makes them successful. Um, and you don't wanna settle because that's kind of what we've been taught, but you do what you wanna do and you make sure to find the school that kind of has that program that best fits for you. Awesome, thank you guys so much. You all just have so many um, just different backgrounds and stories and paths you guys took. So it's really cool to hear um, from each of you. Okay, Brenda, I will give you this next question first and then we can do Zaina then Ricky. So what is some advice you would give a first generation student starting the college search process? Yeah, I think my first thing would definitely be is sitting down and just thinking about what you want or thinking about maybe what you don't want and really going out and just talking to college reps. And like Zaina said, now that we have Zoom and a lot of events are virtual, you can, you know, visit 10 different colleges in one day, right? Um, and doing virtual tours. Because sometimes I think, especially being first generation, you may not know what you like and what you don't like until you see it, right? Because it's not something that you've been taught before. So just really throwing yourself in and immersing yourself into the experience um, and doing as much research as possible. Um, I think a lot of that was exactly what I would do. Um, a thing that I think helps a lot of students is being organized. I know it sucks because a lot of people are like, oh, I hate organization. Um, but one way that I did for me was creating an Excel list um, just a, or a Google spreadsheet. If you have an iPhone or Android, like if you just want to keep notes in your phone 
of schools that you find interesting and maybe someone that you met while you were on that campus tour or an admissions rep that you talked to and you really liked what they said, like keeping all that information organized is gonna be very important, but also like ask, talk to the admissions counselors, talk to us. There are no dumb questions, like we all have been there. Um, so there's no question that's gonna be like, oh, if I ask this, like they're gonna probably think I'm not ready. Like there's no such thing. Like there are so many questions that we also don't know that what we can do to help you. That's pretty much our job. So ask those questions, go on campus tours and very, I think the one of the very coolest thing is that you can actually connect with current students. So ask the admissions rep, like, hey, is there a current student or a student ambassador or someone that I can kind of talk to and ask questions? Because I know a lot of schools now are really connecting those students. Um, so that'll be a really good way to kind of help you make sure you're on that start on that process. Yeah, definitely, uh, Brenda and Dana got, got some good advice. Um, I, I'd kind of like Dana's, you know, had that spreadsheet, you know, with Google now. I mean, you can create your, you know, on your documents, you can create a spreadsheet, write that down. There's a couple of websites that are good when you're researching colleges that I give the students. Niche is one, N-I-C-H-E uh, dot com. And the other one is collegeboard.org. Uh, the people from SAT, they have that big future website where you can start researching uh, colleges. And then also the Department of U.S., uh, Ed Department of Education, um, they have the college scorecard. Again, these are good sites where you could just put in, uh, just if you're searching for a particular geographic area, if you're looking for a large school, small school, and a lot of these will have profiles of the schools. And this is where you'll start to see, okay, um, and a lot of them put down their SAT, ACT requirements, if that if that's an option, um, or they put down how much it costs. And those are the kind of conversations you need to have with your parents about, you know, if something we can afford, if something that looks that, you know, that I can attend. And then, of course, you can kind of see the test scores to see GPA requirements to see if academically, you know, how hard is it to get into that school? So, you know, you're going to have some options. And so definitely keep, I tell students, have that, that net to be a large net. And then, you know, we always tell students have that, that reach school, the school that you know you're going to get into, a safety school. And so, you know, having options is very important because, again, it's having that plan A, plan B, C, D, E, you know, having all these options, again, it's going to, it's going to weigh in your favor in the long run. Awesome, yeah, that is all great advice. Okay, Zaina, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Should a student work while in college or will that be too overwhelming? Um, I think that's gonna be a personal preference. Uh, I will say like a lot of students tend to wait a semester to kind of see get that, that college feel to see what all they can handle. Uh, one thing that I did, I did work while I was in school. I didn't start until my sophomore year, but I was an RA, a resident assistant. So I lived in the residence halls and um, it really helped my tuition because they paid for my housing and they gave me like the unlimited meal plan as well as a stipend on top. So I was getting paid through that as well. Um, and I didn't feel like I was working because I was like hanging out with my friends or helping like the freshmen, like the underclassmen who were coming in. They're like, oh, I don't know where the cafeteria is or I don't know how to handle studying and things like that. So I was already by that time a sophomore um, and I kind of had more experience, but a lot of students do work while they're on campus and that is totally fine. Find a job that best fits you um, and make sure that the job knows that you're a student first because you do want to remember your main priority is school and you can work the rest of your life later, um, but it's definitely going to be a preference for you. Yes, that, you know, it, like uh, Dana said, uh, Zaina said that, you know, it's all about where, you know, how comfortable you are. And then getting a job on campus, that was one of my, uh, it wasn't the first job I did. I remember my junior year, I did, I, I always got work, work study, which is part of your financial aid, but I didn't know what that was. And then one day I asked, so what do I do with this work study? They're like, basically it's a part-time job on campus. And so again, like uh, Zaina mentioned, I mean, it was really, your supervisor is there to help you, um, you know, and if you need to leave, you know, leave early to work on your class assignment or a uh, paper that's due, you know, work study jobs on campus, they're very flexible because again, your day, your supervisors know that you're here to study and that's the most important thing. So I really did, I did that actually. And at the same time, I had another part-time job. So I was kind of going full-time, but it didn't felt like it for me when I felt comfortable. And I waited again to my junior year. So 
I did wait a little bit longer, but uh, but again, it's all about you know what the student's comfortable with. Yeah, thank you. I think you both even answered. We had a question too about you know working on campus, and I would even say too if if y'all feel the the passion for it, even working in an office that supports first generation students, like what better way to just kind of give back and also be a mentor for those students coming in and teaching them what you learned. Um, Cause you know, I know for, for me, it was, you know, I'm very grateful for all of the upperclassmen students that helped me when I was in at DePaul as an undergrad. Um, and so I would even say that like definitely working on campus and, and maybe even working in a way that you can connect with other first generation students. Yeah, that is all really great. Um, okay, Ricky, so what resources are available to help first generation students once they get to college? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of them they have like uh, student support services, whether it's, you know, tutoring, uh, a writing center. Um, I mean, we're at our school, we're about a third of our students are first gen students coming to college for the first time. And since we're such a small campus, you know, our, our faculty and our staff, you know, they're here to kind of we, we kind of put the, the word out that if you see students that need assistance, please, you know, get them to the right people. And so that's what we kind of do here. Uh, and so for us, I mean, the students really, there's, there's definitely, we send them emails, we send them text messages once they get here, like, this is what we're doing. And then, you know, hopefully the faculty will see how they're doing academically. And if they see that they're, you know, maybe they're missing a couple assignments or attendance wise, usually our faculty will step in and they'll say, hey, we've noticed that you haven't been coming around to class. And they just kind of check on them to see because we understand, you know, especially being away from home for the first time, uh, you have a lot of liberties and freedom. And so some students, you know, they adjust to it. And some students, they, they do struggle. So again, providing counseling, providing those tutoring services, that's what we do here. Um, but again, just letting students know that there's people here to help you. And you just got to look. I know people sometimes are afraid to reach out. But again, there's definitely those resources that they, if they look. Yeah, and I would even say, um, so like Ricky said about student support services, looking out for names like TRIO, um, you know, which student support services is under that, looking um, under TRIO is also McNair, you know, for those of you that would essentially want to go into research. Um, so also kind of doing your research too, to see what programs, because a lot of those programs may not just be support, but may also be financial support, which is helpful too. Um, so checking in to see what, what resources there are. Um, one resource that I use, um, and I think Brenda definitely touched on it when she mentioned intersectionality, um, I use the Office of Multicultural Affairs on my campus. Um, that was the biggest support that I've gotten because there were a lot of students that either looked like me or were first generation or low income, and we just all gathered there because we felt safe. That was kind of like our safe space, and we also felt like we all connected and we were all going through the same thing. Um, most of us really became friends, but the super, or not the supervisors, but the, the employees there, the workers who, who are like the directors of the Office of Multicultural Affairs, they were there to support us because they were also first generation or they also had different identities. And they did a really good job of connecting us to other people that they knew could help, whether it was on campus or whether it was just someone in the community overall. Um, I think that is a really big resource is like when you're looking at your intersectionality, um, your different identities that you have, it's kind of nice to kind of have someone else that kind of relates to that and that can also help you find the best support overall. Yeah, I like how you guys shared very specific resources too. That's going to be a great help. Okay, is there anything we didn't talk about today that you feel we should know? Brenda, what would you say? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> the ones that I have to go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, one thing that I didn't realize before is that first generation can mean a lot of different things. Um, so knowing that, you know, first generation doesn't always mean, you know, maybe you're not the first person in your family to go to college, but maybe you're the first in your family to go to college in the U.S., right? So also doing, doing your research too, because um, maybe some of you, maybe kind of like what is first generation, but there's a lot of different definitions. I think that's something that I didn't know until later on. Um, I think 
one word of advice is don't be afraid to kind of mess up. Um, I, I won't say fail because you're not going to fail, but don't be afraid to mess up. Um, I myself, like I told you, I started out as a biomedical engineer, but I did not finish that because I realized I did not like engineering. I hated math. Um, I thought I was really good at it in high school, um, but college was just totally different. It was a beast of its own. And I would never forget, um, I started failing or my grades started slipping. I had never gotten a C before and I got my first C in an engineering calculus class. And I was so scared to tell my mom, but I also was very scared because I thought I was going to get kicked out of school. Um, and I had to go meet with an academic advisor. And she told me, she said, I can see it. Like engineering is not for you. And I'll never forget. I was like, I know she did not just tell me I'm not an engineer. Like, no, I am an engineer. And she was like, I can really see your passion is like definitely in like psychology and biology. Um, based on my grades. And she actually helped me to change my major. I actually changed my major three times. Um, I went from biomedical engineering to clinical laboratory scientist to ending up with a degree in human biology with emphasis in psychology, which is what everyone told me. Um, but I kind of had to learn that my own. Um, and I was very, very scared of what the outcome would be. I thought I would end up in college for eight years, or I thought I would never graduate if I changed my major. And I ended up graduating in four years with um, no mess ups. Like I learned from all my experiences and I definitely used all the resources that I had around me to kind of help me get through that. And they were very supportive. So don't be afraid to mess up. Um, reach out to someone that you could probably trust. Maybe it's a connection that you built while you're on campus to kind of help you get over those humps if you're going through hard times. Uh, you know, Zaina talked about getting involved. That's one thing I thought that, you know, that helped me kind of get through, you know, because you'll, you'll eventually find other students that are you know, kind of like in the same situation as you are. They might be your first time in college or someone of, of a different background, like I'm Hispanic. So I found other people that were Hispanic. Like I joined, a, like she mentioned, the Multicultural Center. That was really uh, basically a place that I felt home um, and, you know, met people that, that had said same um, issues or challenges that I did. So when people were struggling, we kind of reached out and helped each other out. Um, so definitely get involved. And I know people are like, well, I, don't, I just don't want to, they, they just feel uncomfortable making that first step, but you'll you'll be surprised. There's people out there that are just, the students, their current students are just like you. They just, they're just waiting for someone to connect with. And so I, I you know, reach out and, you know, definitely take a look at each college. Cause I mean, now they have like success coaches and now they have like mentors that you could work with for faculty that isn't really your teacher, but they're there to help others. And like I said, the resources now are just crazy now. So, but, you know, just make sure you take a look at what's out there and, and take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, and kind of going off of what Ricky said, I have one more question for you guys. Um, so all of the schools on here tonight, the thing that they have, something they have in common is you all are out-of-state schools. So I know sometimes there's a the myth of out-of-state is so much more expensive than in-state. Um, so kind of debunking that myth, Zaina, we'll start with you. Um, I, what specific resources do your guys' universities have um, that really show that uh, your school can be similar to an in-state cost for our audience tonight? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. One of the main resources that we start with is going to be our merit-based scholarships that are going to be based on students' test scores and GPAs. Um, and obviously this year, because of the pandemic, um, we actually went test optional and we're still pushing to be test optional this upcoming year. So with that, we had a lot of students who, um, for me, when I was in high school, I didn't have any ACT prep or SAT prep. So when it was time for me to take the test, I was not super strong in test taking. And I felt like that really hindered me and it didn't show me being academically strong. Um, however, with us being test optional, we still have a lot of availability for these students to get these merit-based scholarships. Um, our highest one is called the Blazer Elite, which is actually awarded to students um, 24,000 a year. And our tuition and fees right now is 25,000. So that's a really big help, especially for out-of-state students, as well as those who might not be super strong at test taking um, and things like that. And then those are also stackable with outside scholarships. So if you get those like scholarships for first generation or low income or the Pell Grant and things like that, they kind of stack on top of that merit-based scholarship. So it becomes even more affordable for our out-of-state students. 
Yeah, so we are a private institution. So the in-state, out-of-state is the same price. So um, what we do here, again, we're test blind. So when you hear test blind, that means we don't look at test scores at all for admissions and scholarships. So the admissions is gonna look at the GPA, what kind of classes you've taken, the rigor, so the, the difficulty of courses you've taken. And so, and then with the other stuff, your application, your extracurriculars, the essay, letter recommendation, that's how we make our decision. Our scholarships, we do have some great merit scholarships. And we kind of have this formula where we review the applicant and then we kind of give them a score. And again, rigor will help that, that the good GPA rigor. And so usually we give out some great scholarships. Uh, being Texas is our best, that's our next door neighbor and one of our biggest states that we recruit students. We actually give them a little Texas students do get a little extra scholarship money. So again, as a private school, um, you know, we kind of will, it, the price might be when you look at our price, it might be expensive, but at the same time, we give out great merit awards. And like Zaina mentioned, you know, financial aid is another big part, and then getting those other scholarships where you can stack. Um, so hopefully that can reduce the cost. So again, it's just looking at those. Uh, a lot of schools have net price calculators where you can look at their fees, put your family's incomes, and you can kind of get different scenarios of how much the, the school is going to cost. And you can actually do scholarship calculators. Some most schools will have that, or, or not. They have a matrix. You can see the test score, GPA, what they're requiring, and you can kind of get an idea of what kind of awards you can get. And those conversations, again, you can kind of see, well, how much money do I need to raise or or to meet the gap, right? And to hopefully cover for college. So those are some good tips I tell students. Yeah, I would also say too. Um, when, when kind of thinking about that, um, with looking at different universities' missions, right? Um, a lot of you know universities, like for for example, I can you know speak about DePaul. Um, DePaul has a very long mission of service and justice, right? So even though we may be an out of state university, we're also going to have additional scholarships for students that have strong leadership right, um, service kind of backgrounds in their communities, whether it is in school, whether it is, you know, in your parish, in your community, whatever it may be. Um, so sometimes even thinking about universities that are going to offer additional money on top of academic money is always really helpful in kind of thinking that, um, it, you know, it may be possible or being able to offer more money than, than maybe one would, would think. So um, I definitely think, think keeping an open mind and also looking at external scholarships. I think you all would be so surprised as to how many external scholarships are like, we have had no students apply this year and are offering thousands of money. Um, sometimes even if you don't fit all of the criteria, still apply, like well, you never know. Um, so doing your research, you know, reaching out to your school counselor, looking even your community sometimes have additional scholarships too. And then even if you may want to go to whether it is an in-state or out-of-state university, you may be able to stack some of those external scholarships on top of what they offer you. Awesome. Well, Ricky, Brenda, Zaina, thank you guys so much for your time tonight and just really um, getting to answer these questions for our first generation college students. Um, you all, thank you so much for joining our panel. We have one more panel from 730 to 8. The Zoom link is in the chat, Navigating PWI's panel. Um, so I will leave this open here so that you guys uh, can click on that and join our next panel. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us tonight. This recording will be on our DARN website next week. So if you uh, had um, missed this or, I mean, obviously not because you're here, but if you um, obviously want to come back to this, our recording will be posted next week. But thank you panelists and we hope you guys have a great night.